Okay, in the very beginning, uh, I have to say, just like the Professor Frank Chen saying, the happy Mother's Day for all of our very great mother, even uh, either you are mother or not, uh, I have to say the greeting for all of you. Yeah, you are very important. Okay, uh, I'm so happy to have uh, Professor Christopher the Darian uh, to be here with us in our webinar. Uh, ICC. Uh, Dr. Christopher de Darian uh, has completed his uh, plastic surgery residency at uh, New York University and uh, his cranial facial surgery fellowship at the uh, University of Pennsylvania, UPenn. Uh, currently, uh, de Darian is the associate professor uh, of plastic surgery at the UT Southwestern Medical Center. Uh, focusing on the care for patients with craniofacial congenital anomaly. Professor Darian's main activity is the craniosynostosis surgery, clap surgery, and the microtia reconstruction. Besides, he has designed a virtual helmet protocol for sagittal strip craniectomy with favorable outcomes. This already been published in the PRS last year. And he has moderated a panel of mastery of clap rhinoplasty in ASPS. Furthermore, he is an expert with the maple based air reconstruction. Academically, Professor Darian has published numerous papers in the field of craniofacial surgery. Today, uh, we are so honored to have a Professor Darian here to come share the topic clap rhinoplasty. And uh, this presentation will be paneled by two of Chang'an faculty, Professor Feng Chen and Professor Ting Chen Ru. So let's welcome Professor Darian's presentation today. Please, Professor, thank you. Thank you so much, Peng Yun. Uh, and thank you all for having me. It, it's truly an honor to uh, be with you. Um, and I, 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 when I was thinking about how to uh, put together my talk, you know, I'm lucky to consider Peng Yun as a friend. And uh, so I was like, you know, if I was sitting down with Peng Yun at lunch at a meeting, how would I tell him like why I'm doing what I'm doing today in terms of cleft rhinoplasty? And, you know, uh, we were discussing before we started um, about, you know, how, how robust the literature is with regard to cleft rhinoplasty. And so, you know, it's, it's a little hard to do a deep dive in the literature. We could be here all morning. Um, but as I mentioned, I have to make breakfast for my wife uh, for Mother's Day. So <laughs> I, I thought I'd keep it a little bit less formal and a little bit more like, how do I think about things? And so that's how I'd like to speak to you all today as if I were trying to tell my friend, this is how I work. Uh, and, and think about cleft rhinoplasty today. Um, this is how I was, you know, sort of the caveats of, of what I was taught. You know, I trained with cork cutting. And, um, and so this is what I was taught. And then when I tried to put it into action, um, what were my sources of frustration? And then how did I approach those? So are my slides up, Pinyon? Yeah, so could you share the slide? Thank you. Is it sharing now the share screen? Uh, not yet. You have to share again. Okay. Uh huh. Okay. Yes. Do you okay, see it now? Good. Yeah. Yeah. You go. All right. Terrific. So you know, I, I find it useful when someone gives a talk to say what the conclusions are at the beginning because then you have some frame of mind for it's like an abstract for a talk. So. Um, so number one, uh, I think. A, so many times I have seen patients come to me for a revision of a cleft rhinoplasty because they've seen someone in the community. So they've had, you know, their cleft care. They weren't happy with the appearance of their nose. But if you're an adult in the community here in the United States, um, you know, cleft teams are, are located in chil children's hospitals. And so, an adult doesn't want to go to a children's hospital. And so they, they will go to a community plastic surgeon because that's where adults go. 
And the community plastic surgeon doesn't have a lot of experience with clefts. So they see someone's nasal appearance and they think, oh, well, I'm going to do, you know, ABC, you know, maneuvers to try to improve the nasal tip and the nasal asymmetry, because that's how I do it in a, you know, a primary or secondary rhinoplasty. And, and then they're not happy uh, because those procedures are really not, um, you know, uh, relevant to a cleft rhinoplasty because of the, you know, the significant changes in the anatomy of the nose that are uh, the result of having had a cleft. So in general, my thought process is that, you know, those procedures that, you know, are indicated for a primary cosmetic rhinoplasty really don't have a role in cleft rhinoplasty. And if you think about what are reasons why, um, We've had frustrations in advancing, uh, you know, our ability to improve outcomes in cleft rhinoplasty. Uh, it's that much of our experience is founded in co in cosmetic rhinoplasty, and we have all turned to lean towards, oh well, how can we apply our experience in cosmetic rhinoplasty to the cleft patient? And you really need to, you know divorce your your mindset um, from those principles because much of now while in the asian uh, literature so much of rhinoplasty may be um, augmenting or increasing projection of the dorsum or the nasal tip so much of the literature geared towards um, the caucasian patient is geared towards reductive surgery so how do you make the tip less bulbous how do you make the tip uh, less projected? How do you increase um, the rotation of the tip? How do you decrease the uh, projection of the dorsum? Whereas I think so much of what we need to do in cleft rhinoplasty is augment the nose. And so when you have a mindset of reductive surgery, you are, you're kind of destined for, for defeat in uh, a scarred soft tissue envelope, particularly when there's significant asymmetry. So I've tried to, um, in today's talk, really just focus on unilateral clefts. Obviously, bilateral clefts are a substantial challenge uh, in and of their own, but it's just a little bit, out, I think, outside of the scope of what we're going to talk about today. But I think you can uh, glean from the talk that the similar concepts that I use uh, for a unilateral cleft can be applied to a bilateral cleft. And I really think that the challenge with unilateral patients is that, you know, there is substantial asymmetry. And what we, uh, when we're trying to achieve in this case is, is a, a symmetric nose and a very scarred um, soft tissue envelope. Um, and so bilaterals, as you know, are very frustrating and, and difficult, but at least you have symmetry to begin with. And, and when you have an approach to, towards augmenting the nose, I think that you'll see is that these same principles can be applied. I, you know, the second slide is something that I know that you have a lot of experience with. And so I didn't really get into any detail in terms of applying a, a Tejima incision um, for, for improving uh, alar rim symmetry. However, it is my, uh, contention that even in a patient who presents with very minor alar rim asymmetry, so a patient who's had only an isolated cleft lip or a cleft lip uh, associated with, you know, an alveolar notch or an alveolar cleft, um, if there is alar rim asymmetry present and you don't address it, they will have an asymmetric result. And so I include that in, in my conclusions. The biggest problem I think with cleft rhinoplasty is the skeletal asymmetry that is present and around the piriform aperture and how that impacts uh, the projection of the nostril base, you know, in terms of the alar base and, and, and the insertions of the lateral crua into the uh, piriform aperture as well. And if you don't address these adequately, you will not get a good result. Um, Sorry. So in my experience, um, costal cartilage uh, is needed. Um, and I say that because um, 
for a few reasons. One is it's it's very rare that you have adequate um, septal cartilage to to provide the graft material um, required for what I'm about to present in terms of um, you know doing an extended spreader graft, a septal extension graft, in lateral curl strut grafts, plus or minus additional um, grafts to the nasal tip and the airway in terms of batten grafts. And so um, what I'm gonna put into my conclusion just to plant as a seed, not necessarily that I'm gonna present the, the uh, data for this, but I've, I've had an extensive experience with allogeneic costal cartilage. And I found that it's been um, equivalent in terms of providing uh, improvement um, to, the, to the nose. You know, I've been practicing for about 11 years now. And so I've been using this for about seven. And um, in my experience, there, there is not a difference between autologous and allogeneic costal cartilage, but um, I just wanted to, to share that with you that, you know, if that's a resource that you have access to, I think that's a reasonable option to explore. So, you know, if you read articles on cleft rhinoplasty, there are tables that list like 25 to 30 different features that are, you know, uh, asymmetric in, in the uh, anatomy of the patient with a unilateral cleft deformity. I think what is important to recognize are, is the skeletal piece of this um, and how that skeletal piece, despite a repair of the lip, despite um, nasal alveolar molding, um, despite alveolar bone graft, that baseline skeletal deformity is largely uh, persistent, um, even beyond uh, orthognathic surgery. And if you don't address the skeletal differences, I think that you'll see some stigmata of the cleft persisting. And I think that that may uh, frustrate you. And uh, certainly that frustrated me in my uh, experience early on. So clearly there's a deviation of the septum. The anterior nasal spine is displaced and not just the anterior nasal spine, but the anterior nasal spine is sitting on top of the premaxilla and the entire premaxilla, as you can see, is displaced. And there are obviously changes in the soft tissues, including the caimella and the ala, and the, uh, ala base um, with the recurvatum deformity as described by um, Fisher. You know, clefts have a spectrum of deformity, just like cranius anastasis, um, just like microtia, just like all of the things that we take care of, there are various degrees of deformity. But I think you can appreciate that even in the microform cleft lip, that the ala base is malpositioned posteriorly. The premaxilla is malpositioned um, away from the cleft side. And obviously, as you go from left to right across your screen, you will appreciate that those differences become uh, increasingly more severe. Um, and obviously, the cleft um, lip com combined with the complete cleft palate is the most severe, um, of course. You know, when I was training, uh, Dr. Cutting used to lament to me, I oh, an incomplete cleft, like the, the incomplete cleft, the second image from the left, he'd be like, oh, this is my, my, I hate this case, you know, because the parents don't really appreciate how asymmetric the nose is and they're gonna, but afterwards that's all they'll complain about. And I think it's just, an, you know, uh, an insightful, um, you know, kind of anecdote that you know these uh, hidden deformities can be the most frustrating aspects of dealing with um, an incomplete cleft. And obviously the worm's eye view is much more informative of how asymmetric the nose is. And so I found in my own practice that when I have a patient who even has a microform or an incomplete cleft, that I will literally hold the patient in a position where the parents can see the worm's eye view and appreciate how asymmetric the nose is. Now that's 
you might argue a bit of a cop out for me to like, you know, blame the patient for, you know, how my result after the primary repair may be asymmetric, but it ultimately it's a, it's a, uh, it's a real thing. And I'm okay. Sorry. I was just looking at the chat just to make sure I wasn't. And I'm happy with an informal um, d discussion pattern. So if you guys want to interrupt or ask a question while we're uh, proceeding, please um, don't hesitate. That's totally fine with me. So uh, obviously you, you guys are fam familiar with uh, Dr. Fisher. He's a product of your program. Um, Raymond Jay um, was one of his protégés who's at the, at the University of Washington in Seattle. And um, I think it's it's uh, an informative um, you know kind of process to look at how um, Dr. J has looked at the degree of deformity, but also examine more critically how um, the left and right sides of the unilateral cleft may be um, asymmetric. So this uh, article was written in 2020, and um, I think a lot of people have recognized that the non-cleft side is uh, significantly displaced um, in terms of the midline. But if you look at the literature, you know, our eye as humans goes to the not to the cleft side, right? You know, you see, oh, wow, why is the cleft side so uh, displaced? The uh, alar base is so posterior, the nostril rim is down, but you know, uh, in reality, the cleft side is got left behind by the premaxilla as it migrated away from the midline due to the um, the actions of the facial facial musculature and, and the actions of the tongue protruding up into the uh, uh, palatal cleft. And so, you know, I think I, I just think it's worth noting why the asymmetry is present and um, and that uh, you know these differences are going to impact your ability to, to achieve symmetry in a definitive cleft for anoplasty. And if you don't recognize them, you're likely going to underachieve your result. And again, this is just from the same article demonstrating that the midline is significantly off um, in the uh, preoperative deformity and, um, and that, you know, can be persistent. So, you know, if, if you were looking at a paper on nasoalveolar molding, you could see like they're trying to describe why the severity of a cleft changes with uh, the increased uh, uh, elongation of the cleft through the premaxilla into the uh, hard palate and soft palate. But the reality is you could flip those arrows around and that would be, you know, a, a figure for how nasoalveolar molding works. But I think if you look at nasoalveolar molding, despite approximation of the alveolus um, from the medial to the lateral segments and a narrowing of the cleft, the, clearly the asymmetry at the level of the piriform aperture in terms of projection of the alar base is still present. And so, yes, you have a much better nasal shape. Yes, you have a narrower cleft. Peng Yun uh, did a study where they looked at how quickly um, the width of the cleft changes and it's fairly rapid. But yeah, the, the Ehler base asymmetry persists. And if you don't address this um, with your definitive rhinoplasty, you're gonna get a result that may be sub, um, substandard or, or not what you um, preferred. So this is obviously a loaded question. Does primary cleft rhinoplasty impact definitive rhinoplasty? And my answer is probably not. So a pretty smart group wrote a paper about this and showed that they didn't see a long-term change in growth um, when they examined, uh, when you examined your experience. But what I would say is that, um, depending on who's doing the, the primary rhinoplasty and when you are exploring the nose and, uh, and identifying structures and determining how you're going to improve the nasal shape at the time of a definitive rhinoplasty, that you, you may uh, find that, you know, purely the placement of 
sutures to approximate the domes at the time of a primary cleft rhinoplasty may, in fact, you know, uh, cheese wire through the domes. It, it may result in uh, discontinuity of the, lo the lateral, uh, lower lateral cartilages. And um, while that may not impact uh, growth, it may have a, an effect on, on your, um, you know, so, you know uh, structures that you have to work with to achieve a definitive shape at the time of repair. And we're all aware of, of, of what your goals are in a, in a primary uh, cleft rhinoplasty. Um, but I, I think what I would submit to you is that you know, while you might improve the ailer base position, you might improve the width of the, of the tip, um, and you may get a result that is fairly symmetric and that allows the child to, you know, as we say, you know, in, in the US, fly under the radar. So they're, they're not feeling stigmatized in the early parts of childhood. Um, when you, the child goes through a, a growth spurt during puberty, and a, a, a phase of rapid um, growth during uh, the mixed dentition and phase and, and uh, the significant growth spurt in the, in the maxilla and mandible during uh, adolescence, uh, clearly the asymmetry will come back out. And so I just reviewed kind of these potential negative consequences of a primary cleft. So this is a patient of mine. Um, and so I bring this up because this is a patient who is actually a patient of Steve Bird. Steve Bird was at our children's hospital before, um, before I was uh, here. And, and he's obviously a very talented person who has contributed a lot to the field of cleft surgery. But in the, and this patient had, was included in a paper discussing their approach to a bilateral cleft. And, they were very pleased with how she looked when she was, you know, a, you know, a child. But you know, you put the patient into a time machine and you, and you you hit the fast forward button, and what you thought was an excellent result when the patient was five years old becomes a very suboptimal result when the patient is um, is skeletally mature. And so, I think this is a very frustrating part of what we do, but I think it's a real part of what we do. And so I think that, um, you know, thinking about how we um, manipulate the nose when the patient is um, on the, the, you know, the front end of this growth spurt, you know, is, is something that we need to be very conscious of. So, um, so Roberto Flores, um, is uh, at NYU, Roberto and I were co-residents and he was a protege of Dr. Cutting and took over his practice when Dr. Cutting retired. And uh, he wrote up a, a, a paper looking at um, Dr. Cutting's uh, experience. And this is how I learned how to do a cleft rhinoplasty. And so um, it illustrates a lot of, in this, you know, illustration, you know, a lot of the asymmetric features. So the dome on the cleft side is depressed, the ailer base can be malpositioned. And DeBell wrote an art article many, many years ago about medializing the ailer base um, as a bipedical flap uh, in continuity with the nasal floor and the medial cruise. And Dr. Cunning incorporated that along with the Tajima incision. Um, but what I found in my experience is that um, this is this is a, an operation that is very dependent on the uh, uh, qualities of a Caucasian uh, nasal tip, where you have very projected and strong lower lateral cartilages, and uh, it doesn't really apply um, across um, you know racial boundaries, and. It also doesn't address the skeletal asymmetry in, in a very in a real way. It's just effect. It's really addressing the medial and lateral malpositioning of the uh, ailer base, but not the anterior posterior malposition of the ailer base. So I found this image of uh, a craniofacial skeleton of a patient with um, an unrepaired cleft, 
And, um, but I think it's very um, informative just of how uh, three dimensional the uh, asymmetry is uh, around the piriform aperture. And, you know, while we are very aware of how um, the anterior structures um, are affected, including the anterior nasal spine and the septum, if clearly that the, the uh, piriform aperture is very asymmetric um, in addition to the orbital structures. And if you don't address this, I think that you're going to have a suboptimal result. You know, McComb um, and Cutting both wrote papers describing that the lower lateral cartilages had, uh, you know, equivalent mass. Um, However, the mechanical forces of straddling, straddling a cleft to form the cartilage. But um, there is clearly um, a difference between the right and left sides, um, not only in terms of uh, the shape, but in terms of the insertion points of um, the lateral crew. And this is something that's critical to address. So, uh, Again, Dr. Fisher and, and uh, Jeffrey Marcus, who's at Duke, um, have written this uh, article that describes the general changes in the anatomy of a cleft. But I think that their depictions are, are very realistic from the standpoint of how the lateral cruise inserts on the piriform aperture. And if you have structures that are so asymmetric in terms of their insertion points and you don't address that, it's hard to believe that you're going to achieve uh, not only good symmetry in terms of appearance, but you know, it's, it's hard to believe that you're gonna make that left nasal airway in this image uh, function from a, uh, a breathing standpoint. And so, you know, this is a, an image just kind of further depicting that asymmetry in terms of the skeletal positioning of the alar base. And, uh, and, if, and I think this really just illustrates what a challenge it is to try to achieve symmetry in a, in a cleft. So I challenged one of my research fellows to examine this further. And because I, you know, I, I saw this as a real challenge and I wanted to I um, wanted to be able to address this, but I, I wanted to quantify what is, what is it that we're trying to correct. And so this heat map, as you guys have become familiar with through Peng Yoon's work, is, um, is showing you uh, on the, the right side in a unilateral cleft, um, the, the more anterior part is in blue and the more posterior part is in, in red, but it's just showing you how the left alar base is under projected. And obviously the images on the, the left side of the screen show how the, the skeletal residual skeletal asymmetry, despite having had a bone graft and having skeletal continuity um, are present. Now, I think clearly anybody who does an alveolar bone graft would think, well, this doesn't look like an ideal outcome from a bone graft, but obviously this is, I think, a fairly typical outcome from a bone graft, depending on um, where, you know, who you're seeing in your clinic. And I think that there is something to be said um, for um, having an understanding of the suboptimal result and how you need to address the suboptimal result. Because if you're a major referral center, as you are, you're going to have patients coming from abroad who have had suboptimal um, surgeries performed. And if that suboptimal outcome is present, despite having skeletal continuity, you need to have an algorithm in hand to address that so you can achieve uh, the ideal outcome that you uh, persevere towards. Um, and, you know, so yes, you could look at this and say, well, I need to do my bone graft better. But if you're not the one doing the bone graft, then that's sort of a moot point. What you need to then concentrate on is this patient has had perhaps a suboptimal outcome and I need to fix this. And so that's essentially the patient population that I find myself dealing with um, on a weekly basis. 
So this is a patient that I did a cleft rhinoplasty on. And you can look at the result and say, wow, his nose looks straight and uh, his alar rims look better and he's happy. Um, but if you look critically at the result, you know, you can see how the skeletal asymmetry has not been addressed adequately. And uh, ultimately, while he is happy with the result, um, I think we could have done better. And, and so this is a patient who I took care of, let's say, five or six years ago. And I thought, okay, I'm heading in the right direction, but I'm not there yet. And so uh, how does this impact his appearance? You might say, well, he looks symmetric in the AP view, but I think if you were to look at the left versus the right sides, I think that clearly he has a much more convex facial shape in the image on the left, which is his non-cleft side versus the image on the right, which is his cleft side. And so, uh, you know, in my mind, clearly the, the right side image is a more youthful appearance. It's uh, more congruent with his age and, um, and more congruent with a non-cleft or a non-stigmatized uh, appearance. So ultimately what I concluded from this was, uh, my early experience was, you know, the skeletal asymmetry, even if you do jaw surgery on, on the patient, which I did, that patient had a, uh, a, a Lefort one distraction, uh, you know, you may not achieve symmetry in terms of the skeletal deformity. So how do you address it? Like, so you've done jaw surgery and you, you have a class one occlusion, but the patient at the level of the piriform aperture and the, in the mid face above the level of the Lefort segment or even at the level of the fourth segment is asymmetric. So I thought, well, there's this fancy technology where we can make a mirror image and then just make an implant. So let's make an implant. So we'll, we'll fix the bony part and then it'll, it'll be fixed. And this patient is an extreme example. She has had jaw surgery. She's got severe skeletal asymmetry. Um, you can see that she's got, for reasons I don't know, she's got a scar um, vertically positioned on the nasal tip, kind of very close to the soft triangle. And so I didn't do a Tajima incision in her for that reason, because I was afraid to devitalize the skin. But, um, but I, I knew that I needed to augment her piriform aperture in order to get a more symmetric result. And I think clearly she looks better in the image on the right than the image on the left. And I've um, improved some uh, bulk in the upper lip and released some soft tissue in the BY in the upper lip. But skeletally, even though I put that uh, peak implant in, she's clearly skeletally uh, asymmetric. And so, uh, now you can look at the soft triangle and understand how that impacts uh, her nostril asymmetry for the reasons that I just uh, discussed, but her ala base position is still asymmetric. And you can see how that's impacting her entire uh, tip complex by tilting the tip to the right side because of inadequate support. So while her profile on each side looks adequate, you know, she's still flatter on the cleft side and, uh, and I, I feel like she still looks, you know, more aged on the left side. She looks much more aged on the right um, side of her face, which is on the left side of the screen than on the left where she looks more like a teenager. And of course, you know, as luck would have it, she has an identical twin who of course is beautiful. And so, you know, that obviously raises the bar for, you know, our outcomes as well. And so, while she looks significantly better, she still does not look anything like her uh, beautiful twin sister. And so, you know, these are things that make us want to do better. And so I asked the question, well, is bony symmetry enough? Like I, I made the bone symmetric and it didn't look good enough. And so I, I had one of my research fellows look at, okay, well, if you move the the, the bone forward into a symmetric position into a class one occlusion. And there's typically a yaw movement with that where you're rotating 
the cleft side alar base um, or the cleft side piriform aperture towards the midline because it's typically deviated away from midline, does that fix the asymmetry? And I think you can tell from these images that it's certainly better, but it's not perfect. And if you look at it, at the results of the study, um, this is a very busy slide. So for the, the sake of time, what I would, and this is not published yet, but for the sake of time, what I would tell you is that the skeletal difference is real. Uh, and that's what's in table two at this top line. So there's about a five millimeter difference before about a three millimeter difference after jaw surgery. So while it's lessened, it's still present, but there's certainly a soft tissue component to this as well. But the net effect is that there is still a significant asymmetry between the two sides of roughly a centimeter. And so what I then turned to was in my cleft rhinoplasties was uh, using rib cartilage to augment the piriform aperture. I apologize that this doesn't have a three dimension. I should have another image that shows you the, the projection of this. But I think what you can tell is that the inferior and medial portion of this has not been cut at all. And you can kind of see the irregularity of the cartilage um, towards the inferior and medial component. And then as you look superiorly and laterally, you'll see that it tapers. And so what essentially this is, is like a wedge of cartilage with the medial and most inferior part of the cartilage being the most projected in terms of the AP dimension. And what I'm trying to essentially do with this is make up for the difference in the projection um, skeletally at the level of the Ehler base. So I think there are a couple of advantages over peak with this. Uh, one advantage is that um, it's easy to adjust this. A peak implant is rigid and so you'd have to burr it down. Um, and the other piece of a peak is that you need to fix it um, with screws um, to make sure that it doesn't move and migrate. And if you've done jaw surgery in a patient where there's already a plate in place, that can create some issues in terms of interference, in terms of fixation. And with a, you know, this rib cartilage, what you can do is essentially make a very limited pocket and then that just accommodates the implant. And, um, and, and that allows for a stable positioning. But I think it allows you to put it in, see what your uh, effect is in terms of the Ehler base and you can add or subtract from that as needed. In my experience, uh, anecdotally, you need somewhere between seven and 10 millimeters of augmentation in order to get the Ehler base in a, in a comparable AP projection. Uh, I think even if you had a greater uh, deficiency, uh, the soft tissues will, will be limiting because then you're needing to medialize your Ehler base over the, the augmentation and, and there's a, a high chance of you having some com complications of perhaps um, the Ehler base reverting back to a more lateralized position. But, and again, it's a little bit outside the scope of this, but initially I placed these through a gingival buccal sulcus incision, but I would say that that, that was just because that's how I'm used to approaching the piriform aperture. Now I favor doing this through an, an incision um, in, in the, uh, Ehler crease and extending into the nasal floor. So an L-shaped incision and then just bluntly dissecting down to really limit the pocket. Because if you do it through a sulcus incision, you'll have some inferior migration of the implant. Um, but I've been very pleased with, with the result of this. So this is a patient who um, really needed jaw surgery. And I sent her to an oral, an oral surgeon colleague and said, I know that you've had braces, but you need jaw surgery because you're so skeletally asymmetric. And she went to see the, the surgeon. And I think basically every patient who, who's an adult who I had sent to an oral surgeon comes back and says, I don't want jaw surgery, and, uh, and which is understandable, but then you need to overcome a substantial um, skeletal issue. So this is showing uh, her before and just a week out from a rhinoplasty. Um, but it just illustrates the, um, the effect of augmenting that piriform aperture in terms of the ALIC base position. And there, I, I think there's a real effect there in terms of how that impacts, you know, your, apologize, 
um, how that impacts your um, your your appearance in terms of the <clears throat> AP view as well, because she looks so much more youthful in the post-operative image as compared to the pre-operative image, just because we've augmented the mid face. Um, and in fact, she looks quite syndromic even on the left side image um, as a result of her mid face hypoplasia. And, and that's essentially extinguished um, in the image on the right. So is there a higher fidelity way to do this? Well, clearly, as I've been putting rib cartilage into the ailer base of patients um, in whom I've not done jaw surgery, I thought, well, what should I be doing at jaw surgery? Because there's no need to go back into the same region where you're looking right at it when you're doing the jaw surgery. And so this is, um, now this is a very atypical case because if you look, this patient is actually getting rotated towards the cleft side because of her, her dental asymmetry and her, you know, she's got multiple teeth absent. So normally, obviously the dental midline would be getting rotated away from the cleft side, but it just, I think, adds to the demand for some kind of skeletal augmentation of the piriform aperture. So if you looked um, at a mirror image of the non-cleft side uh, on the left and the cleft side on the right, um, you would see in green how there is a significant um, paucity of, of uh, bone in the floor and piriform aperture as you ascend superiorly. And so I think one way to make up for this is to um, add to a, a custom plate. And so this is uh, something I've developed with KLS Martin where you can uh, provide uh, augmentation of the, of the craniofacial skeleton as an extension of a custom orthognathic plate in order to um, make up for the skeletal asymmetry between the cleft and non-cleft sides. And this is probably, this is like version 1.0 of this, and I'm sure that this will continue to evolve. But um, in my mind, uh, titanium is, a, is an ideal uh, implant uh, material for uh, augmenting the facial skeleton because it's fairly protected from infection and it's fairly protected from extrusion. Um, and uh, it's fairly you know, inert and does not cause issues uh, for the patient. And so uh, you can see here how this type of implant can provide a fair amount of um, uh, symmetric support for the ailer base. So I'm just checking to make sure I'm doing okay on time. I'm probably gonna go over a little bit, but yeah, um, so I, I, I'm just gonna show a couple images because I feel like the artist rendering of what's going on with the cleft is always confusing. And I feel like clearly a surgeon is involved in drawing these images, but you know, there are lots of, uh, odd, you know, kind of uh, artistic licenses shown in these uh, images. So clearly the, the upper lateral cartilage doesn't magically get longer on the cleft side um, when you have, a, you know, displacement of the lower lateral cartilage. Uh, this image shows, uh, you know, a, a reverse C-shaped deformity of the dorsum that doesn't exist in a cleft patient, but you know this is how the artist is looking at the images and interpreting it in their mind. And they are also kind of confabulating that the lower lateral cartilage lives in the ala when it, it clearly it doesn't live in the ala. But you know, I think that these are not present because. Um, because the artists are, are poor artists or because the surgeons um, don't understand the anatomy. It's just, it's a very three-dimensional problem. And, but it goes back to the, the skeletal piece, right? So ultimately, if you have two cartilages of the same size that are inserting at the, you know, chiamella, nasal tip, the, whatever the, midline structure is of the nose and one is a centimeter more anterior than the other, then if, if you don't disconnect the lateral cruise on the cleft side or disconnect 
the midline and bring it posteriorly, which you're not going to do because that does not look good for the patient, you have a very poor chance of, achieve, of, of achieving symmetry, one, and two, you have a very poor chance of achieving a patent nasal airway because the cartilage is going to bowstring into the nasal airway and cause a nasal uh, valve collapse, um, plus or minus an external valve collapse. But, you know, that's, I think, why this is so challenging is because, again, we're trying to think of these very complex three-dimensional issues through the lens of a cosmetic rhinoplasty thought process. And, and, and it's really a nasal reconstruction thought process. So if you look at, uh, so this is kind of like, I just mocked this up, like, all right, I'm, uh, this is something I used to kind of talk to the residents before a rhinoplasty case. I just kind of, all right, I'm gonna put some dorsal aesthetic lines on here and I'm gonna show them why the nasal tip is deviated. I'm gonna show them why the alar base, you know, is malpositioned. I'm gonna show them why the alar rims are asymmetric. But this is all a function of skeletal asymmetry. And so, you know, we've talked about why Tajima incision is important and that will address, you know, the soft triangle. There's an excess, essentially an expansion of the infilobular tip skin into the area where a soft triangle should exist because the cleft lower lateral cartilage has, due to the forces uh, that developed in utero, has essentially tissue expanded the nasal tip in this infralobular position. And it's ablated or extinguished the area where the skin on skin soft tissue facet of the soft triangle should be. And so a Tajima incision is the way to achieve correction. But if you look beyond that, that the, the lower lateral cruise uh, it is medialized because of this bow stringing effect, despite the fact that it's very um, lateral and posterior to, to the um, dome. And it's just a function of there's not enough cartilage to span the skeletal defect. It's, it's really that simple. And so this is just, you know, again, for me to depict to the trainees, this is what's going on. And so if you don't disconnect the lateral cruise from the piriform aperture, you're not going to uh, improve the nasal airway patency. Yes, you can put lots of cartilage grafts on top of that, that malposition dome and maybe achieve tip symmetry, but you're not going to improve their nasal airway patency. So this is not a new concept. So, so John Potter described this in, in 1954. Um, in fact, I think he probably initially described this in the 40s. So this is a well-recognized uh, concept. You know, the problem with the Potter technique is that it doesn't address the difference between the axes of the cleft and non-cleft lateral crew. So this is an illustration from um, Dr. Taylor at uh, CHOP in, in Philadelphia, where they described their take on a Potter repair. But you can see the med medical illustrator has taken some liberties to magically make the axes of the lateral crew match, even though clearly the soft tissue would not allow this. And so you can improve the positioning, but you're not going to get a symmetric nose because the axes of the nose of the lateral crew are different, one. And two is uh, the soft tissue lining of the nose is not adequate to support the lateral cruise in this new position. So just because you relieve this bowstringing effect of the lateral cruise doesn't mean that the nasal airway patency is going to be improved. So in my opinion, this is you know, the right idea, but the wrong execution for these reasons. So I've had the benefit uh, in Dallas of attending the cleft, or sorry, not cleft, <laughs> attending uh, Dr. Rorick's, uh, you know, rhinoplasty symposium every year for like the last 10 years. And I've heard lots of thought leaders in rhinoplasty. And so I was sitting in a lecture by Dean Toriumi, who is, in my opinion, the thought leader of rhinoplasty. And, um, and I listened to a talk on, you know, cephalic malposition of the, you know, lateral cartilages 
and, and how that impacts your ability to read, you know, to adjust for, um, you know, differences in terms of rotation of the nasal tip because of the, these, uh, you know, very cephalically oriented lower lateral cartilages. And if you need someone who's got an upturned nose or a short nose and uh, retracted ala, and you're trying to improve the tip shape and the lateral, um, you know, the um, retracted alar positioning that, you know, repositioning the lateral crua to a more um, inferior position uh, is, is necessary. And so I'm just listening to the talk and I'm like, you know, light bulb, this is what you need to do for the cleft. And so um, as it turns out, then I subsequently like did some more homework and watched some more videos of Dr. Toriumi. And if you look, watch how he does a cleft, in fact, this is exactly how he does a cleft, is repositions the lower lateral crura. In fact, if you watch the videos, he does some really scary stuff where he like cuts right through the dome and changes the axis of the lateral crura to be more symmetric. But, uh, but this to me made perfect sense. And I was like, okay, well, that's what I'm gonna start doing. So if you, if you look at the cartilages on, under tension here, you can see how the axes are very different from one another. Now, the cleft side is less cephalically oriented, but that's, that's not the point. The point is that because it's insertion on the piriform aperture is so posterior compared to the non-cleft side, that you need to dis, disarticulate the lateral cruise from the piriform aperture in order to get the domes into a more symmetric position. And so this is showing you a different angle. So you can see how posteriorly displaced the, the domes are on the cleft, the dome is on the cleft side compared to the non-cleft side and how there's no way you're gonna get those together unless you, discon, you know, disarticulate that lateral cruise from the piriform aperture. So this is showing you, you separate the lining similarly to how you would do in a cephalic uh, scroll trim, you know, where you're re removing it off. But you, you can wholesale remove the lining from the lateral cruise. And, and then that allows you to position that wherever you want. And, uh, and it also affords you the ability to essentially perform a lateral curl steel uh, procedure in order to improve the quality of uh, the tip symmetry. And so this is just illustrating how that lateral curl steel can provide you a symmetric tip position in terms of the dome um, on the cleft side, but also you can uh, manipulate the angle um, of the lateral cruise to mirror the non-cleft side and achieve a more symmetric result in terms of the, the lateral cruise positioning. So you can see the lining, there's, if you reposition it, as I've uh, suggested, that there's going to be a gap in terms of support. And um, what I what I do for this, I've gone through a couple of different approaches, but initially I was suturing some additional cartilage to the uh, soup, to the uh, uh, upper lateral cartilage in order to span this and provide some support. But that may actually have a negative effect on term in terms of your uh, internal valve um, uh, angle and patency. So now what I do today is essentially just overlay a batten graft and do a through and through suture just to kind of provide some additional support to this nasal lining so it doesn't um, become totic and slump down into the nasal airway. Again, you know, I started doing a, a septal extension graph because I was like, okay, that's part one. Part two is I need to support this like floating lower lateral cartilage and dome with something more substantial than a, a Connie Miller strut. And, you know, as Dr. McCarthy would say, you know, if you have an idea, you look in the literature, probably like three Germans described it like a hundred years ago. But, you know, in this case, you know, Dr. Guyron um, had described, you know, this, his approach to lengthening the nose, but essentially providing support to the tip and, and controlling the nasal labial angle. And so this is obviously something that's important in terms of the cleft deformity. And so I started employing this. So this is showing you 
in an ideal circumstance, I like to use septal cartilage for the uh, nasal tip um, support and, and the septal extension graft because I think this is obviously the most important part of the case. Likewise, I think that um, lateral curl struts are important, but you can see here, this is rib cartilage. This is a, a allogeneic car, uh, costal cartilage that's made by a nonprofit here in the US called MTF. That's Musculoskeletal Tissue Foundation. And they call this a profile costal cartilage sheet. But this is showing you a different case where I'm fixing the upper laterals to a septal extension graft. And these are extended spreader grafts. And you may or may not decide to add additional support inferiorly. Today, I rarely do that. But, um, but this provides ability to control your nasal labial angle and control your tip position. Um, and if you combine this with lateral curl strut graphs, you can really control um, where your tip is in space and also um, help provide stability to the nasal airway. So I fix the, the medial cura to the septal extension graph with through and through chromic sutures. And um, this is just kind of showing you how you, you can position the uh, medial cura symmetrically. And then again, in an ideal situation, I like the uh, compliance of septal cartilage for a lateral curl strut. And this is just showing you lateral curl strut position in place. I've not performed an interdomal suture yet, but you can see I've done a transdomal suture, which gives you a nice quality in terms of contour. And once the, uh, they're together, now in this case, I probably would have done a little um, tip graft on top of the uh, dome on the cleft side, but you, I think that this is a fairly ideal um, tip complex in terms of providing good shape um, and uh, airway patency. So this is the patient, that same patient that I just showed you before and after surgery. Um, I did perform a Tajima incision in hand. Um, uh, and I think that you can see that we've lengthened his nose, we've projected his nose, um, we've given him a longer and more projected, uh, more masculine nose, but given him good um, delicate features in terms of the nasal tip in the setting of a fairly thick soft tissue envelope. And this is um, a patient who I showed you earlier who had surgery when she was a kid and then uh, basically kind of like fell out of the team um, apparatus. Uh, she was from Oklahoma, which is the state just, just north of Texas. So she lived about five hours away. And she came to me and she had not had uh, jaw surgery. She had an alveolar bone graft, but she had not had anything else. But she had severe uh, asymmetry because she, essentially I don't believe that she had um, a, a primary cleft rhinoplasty. And um, I performed the same kind of procedure where I augmented the ALR base with, with costal cartilage. And, and I did a similar um, rhinoplasty where I repositioned the lateral cura and provided support with uh, lateral curl strut grafts, septal extension grafts, and extended spreader grafts. And this is her non cleft side. So I feel like even her non cleft side is substantially better because we've increased her projection, we've uh, corrected her uh, retracted columella and we've given her some super tip break. And obviously on her cleft side, we've, with the Tejima incision, corrected um, the excess infralobular tip skin that's basically um, hiding the columella. And we've corrected a very significant um, skeletal asymmetry that was causing her to have a near complete obstruction of left nasal airway. So back to my conclusion. So, so I think there's no role really for a columnar strut in tip sutures and tip grafts alone in uh, controlling the nasal tip position in a cosmetic, you know, rhinoplasty approach to cleft rhinoplasty. Cleft rhinoplasty is, I think, by definition, a nasal reconstruction, and you need to wholesale reconstruct the nose. Again, if an ailer even a minor ALRM asymmetry is present, you must do a Tajima incision to correct that. Otherwise the ALRMs will be asymmetric and that is what the patient will always point to 
as a, a, a source of dissatisfaction. If you do not address the schedule asymmetry, and I, I don't have any skin in the game in terms of how you do it, but I feel like you must do it. Uh, you must address it to get your ALA base in the correct position in order to have a chance at getting a symmetric uh, correction of the nose. And I feel like that asymmetry and that hypoplasia makes the patient, the patient feel like they look aged and that they look um, the left, the cleft and non-cleft sides of their uh, face are not congruent in terms of the aging process. And so if you wanna give the patient a youthful appearance, you must address this. And lastly, the lateral cruise, it has to be disarticulated from the piriform aperture um, in the setting of a complete cleft in order to address the airway in a satisfactory way. And while I didn't present data to support this, I, I, I feel like this is a, a true statement anecdotally that costal cartilage is gonna be needed in most cases to have the adequate control of the soft tissue envelope because there are so many graphs that are needed in order to achieve a septal extension graft, an extended spreader graft, lateral curl struck graft, um, and the batten grafts that I discussed to provide support to the airway. And thank you so much for having me. It's really been an honor. And thank you to Peng Yun. Uh, he's, he's a good friend and, and uh, you all should be so proud of him because he represented you so well down here in Dallas. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Dardarian, for your wonderful lecture. And um, I'd like to congratulate you on your great results. And thank you for giving us a lot to think about and put a lot of things into perspective. Now, before we head to the Q&A section, um, I'd like to invite our panelists for some comments. Uh, first of all, uh, Professor Lowe. Hmm. Uh, hi, Dr. Dardarian. It's nice to see you again. Since of several years ago, I visited your hospital. Yeah. Uh, I enjoy your talk. Uh, and uh, I find that there's some uh, difference between Asian and Caucasian uh, credit nasal deformity. Can you just first summarize, since you are in Texas, maybe you have also have experience of Asian credit uh, deformity and Caucasian uh, crab nose deformity. Can you summarize what's the difference between the two? And also when you do reconstruction, uh, how you choose the technique? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, we do have uh, a fair sized Asian population in Richardson, which is in the north part of Dallas. Um, but most of my experience in Asian rhinoplasty has been um, through kids who have been adopted, um, you know, from China into the United States. Um, I think there are clear differences in terms of the shape of uh, the nostril and how that may impact how you decide to um, perhaps use or not use a Tajima incision or how that Tajima incision would be um, shaped. Um, I know that your group has talked about using rib cartilage to improve um, nostril rim asymmetry. And I think that that, you know, transcends uh, racial differences for the reasons that we discussed in terms of overcoming the effects of scar tissue and, you know, the vestibular web effects in, in terms of nostril asymmetry. My, you know, the major influence on me has been the Hispanic population because, you know, I came down to Texas and, um, you know, Ortiz Monasterio discussed the kind of three different kind of general um, types of uh, Hispanic noses. But in my experience, my patient population has very, very thick skin and very weak lower lateral cartilages and uh, a paucity of septal cartilage to use for graft material. And so I was trying to perform the DeBell or Potter approach that cutting taught me, but I was using flimsy cartilages to try to overcome thick soft tissue. And um, Hispanic patients, I think like Asian patients are vigorous scar formers. Um, and so the soft tissue envelope is, is really not um, forgiving in terms of uh, shape and definition. 
So um, I sort of took a step back and I talked to Joe. L I remember Joe Losey came as a visiting professor and he's like, you know, you have to use red. Like, you know, I was talking to him about this and I just didn't have experience with it. Um, but I started using red, started using autologous. I started using the allogeneic red and between that experience and, um, you know, digesting these concepts from Toriumi in terms of lateral pro repositioning, I came to find that I think really these can be applied to any nose. Um, but I do think that you have to be cognizant of staying within the boundaries of having a racially congruent outcome, right? So taking a very, very projected um, Caucasian nose and trying to in, implement that in the Asia patient is not necessarily going to make the patient happy. And so um, I'm not suggesting that, you know, the, the same operation be employed in every patient, but I do think the principles in terms of support and nasal airway um, reconstruction, I think, do apply for most patients. Uh, thank you. Uh, the second question uh, is that uh, you, when you uh, look at the nasal, uh, the, the correct nasal deformity, you see the ala based depression, you wish to augment the preform margin. Do you do that augmentation of preform base and uh, open rhinoplasty together in the same stage or a separate stage? Yes. I think that's a, a, it's a great question and it's, it's critical that you augment the piriform aperture before you even design your incisions. And so I'll perform, so it's, it's an L, so it's, you're using an existing scar from the cleft repair at the ba uh, nasal um, base and in the alar um, cheek junction, if it's there, extending into the lip and then up into the nasal floor. And that you need a sizable length of incision to be able to fit that wedge in a very limited pocket, put the cartilage in. I close the skin to make sure that I'm simulating as much as I can what the new ala base position is. Then I mark the tajima incision because if you did it before, you would likely uh, underestimate, you know, how what the the, the tajima incision needs to be, um, you know, medially, and you'd probably overestimate where it needs to be laterally. Mm. Okay. <clears> then <throat> I'm also uh, happy to hear that you use Tajima incision, which uh, not many Caucasian doctors uh, do Tajima incision. But yeah. in, in our practice, we use Tajima incision very often, okay? In the primary uh, rhinoplasty or secondary, secondary rhinoplasty, we find that it is very helpful procedure. Do you do Tajima rhino, rhinoplasty in the primary uh, repair? I have not. Um, and I, you know, I know so it's, it's a controversial topic in terms of when you go to talks, some people will get up there and will say, I do it in everybody and I never have a problem. It's like making a subsidiary incision in the eyelid, right? Like people will tell you, don't do it because the eyelid will come down, right? <laughs> and, and, there, and then the next person will get out there and be like, I've never had a complication. Mm -hmm. So uh, I have not done it, but in honesty, I think if I had, I would get better outcomes because I feel like it, it does um, negatively impact what you can achieve with your primary rhinoplasty. For a couple of reasons. One is the visualization of the cartilages would be much better. Um, your ability to primarily approximate the cartilages under direct visualization would be would be ideal. And um, and so, but I, I wasn't taught that by cutting. In fact, you know, he was like, Well, I'm not sure you want to do that because X, Y, and Z, and or he'd be like, Don't worry about it, uh, you'll fix it later. But in actuality, I feel like uh, I need to do it. I'm just afraid to do it. Um, but I think, <laughs> to be honest, but I think that I would get a superior outcome. So you would think like, here's someone who is doing this with without abandon in every adult rhinoplasty, but afraid to do it in an infant. 
Um, mm -hmm. I guess what I would say is my only concern is that um, I, I do think for doing a lateral curl strut is important in terms of controlling retraction of the skin once you've inset it. Now, the other piece of it is, because I'm a total win, even though you guys have talked about harvesting cartilage from the septum and doing a primary cartilage graft at the time of the primary rhinoplasty, again, something I do all the time in an adult rhinoplasty or an adolescent rhinoplasty, I've totally wimped out on doing it. Even though I know it's a great idea and you've shown great results, I just haven't had the guts to do it yet, but I know that I need to. So maybe I'll come out there and watch you guys do it. And then I'll have the, I'll be brave enough to do it over here. Hmm. Now, now the, the last point is that I, I do agree very much with you that septal extension graph is very important to control to, to, uh, to reconstruct the nasal tip in the secondary renal plasty. I think uh, the audience here should be encouraged to perform septal extension graft. It is very important to control the nasal tip. So I uh, appreciate your, your contribution and uh, thank you for your presentation. Please say hello to Dr. Alice Ken. I will, I will. And to your point, I think that, you know, um, the rigidity that people are afraid of Oh, if my, the tip is too stiff, the patient won't be happy. And I think that um, even when you're using rib to do the septal extension graft, I tell the patients like, your nose is going to feel like a rock for six months. <laughs> like it's like, and they're, they're like, oh, I can't, you know, I can't move it. But at two years post-op, it's totally mobile and, and it feels like a normal nasal tip. And I think that the stability piece if you warn them and you say, hey, look, your nose is going to feel like a rock for a year, but then it's going to be fine, they'll be fine. But if they're not ready for it, then they'll be unhappy with you. Hmm. But, but it was controversial here for a long time. And now that's gone. Like septal extension grafts are in vogue in the United States right now for that reason, because a chiomelic strut has limitations in terms of how much projection it can really provide. Thank you. Now back to you, Junior. Thank you, Professor Lo. And now I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Chang, Dr. Frank Chang. Hello, uh, Dr. Uh, Darian. It's nice to uh, hear your speech. A very wonderful uh, result. Uh, I, I noticed that uh, uh, in Caucasian and the Taiwanese, they are uh, a lot some difference. For example, um, in most of instances, we need uh, nasal augmentation uh, to, to, not, not, to not only to augment nasal dosing, but also correct the deviated nasal dosing. Uh, do you do anything to correct the nasal bone deviation or nasal dosing deviation? Yes. Uh, yes. So, um, so I, I do. I do osteotomies, I do, um, so oblique osteotomies. So I'll, I'll take them, if there's a hump, I take the hump down, um, which there is in a lot of patients. And then I'll do a, a low to low osteotomy and an oblique osteotomy to close the nasal roof. And on the cleft side, they're always gonna be kind of flat. Um, and so I'll prefer to use a wide uh, spreader graft when I'm on that side and I'll have it kind of really flush with the dorsum to try to correct that uh, convexity that's there, or sorry, rather concavity. The non-cleft side is, is, has a little bit of residual curvature, even if you, from the soft tissue and the upper lateral cartilage. So I, I will recess that um, graft just a little bit. Um, I don't routinely augment the nasal dorsum, um, but if I do, my preference is to do a dice cartilage graft um, with deep temporal fascia versus doing a, a, a segment. Um, you know, something that I'm not sure if it's becoming in vogue in Taiwan yet, but in the United States, dorsal preservation rhinoplasty is becoming very popular. And now in the cleft patient where there's a lot of asymmetry, it maybe is a challenge to do it, but I've heard Toriumi recently speak that instead of adding cartilage to the dorsum, he's raising the dorsum up and putting cartilage 
deep in the septum to in a dorsal preservation approach to augmenting the nasal dorsum in Asian patients. So I have a feeling we're going to go through a little bit of a of a you know thought shift and um, in terms of uh, preserving the dorsum and augmenting the dorsum in that way, because if you can hide rib cartilage deep down in the nose and not have to worry about warping or things of that nature as much as when it's sitting right on top of the dorsum and you can bring the native dorsum forward. I think that's going to be obviously of great utility to the Asian rhinoplasty. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and the other question is just curiosity. Uh, in your talk, you said that you learned from uh, Dr. Ko Kating. And uh, in your presentation, the nasal alveolar molding performed in your uh, institution is a uh, uh, Figueroa's uh, nasal without anterior extension uh, bar. Do you see any uh, difference between those tools? Um, so we have a very talented um, orthodontist. Um, I would say that he's less aggressive than Dr. Grayson was in terms of um, getting the alveolar segments to be like literally kissing one another so that, that gingival periosteoplasty is an option. So I find that in most circumstances, um, the cleft is narrowed. There is still some residual AP discrepancy and there's a gap between the alveolar edges, a slight one, so that I don't think a GPP is, is, is possible. Um, I don't know how it impacts my long-term outcomes, but maybe it saved me because I'm not doing GPPs in patients. And I don't know, in 20 years, if they say GPPs are evil, then I'll be blessed that he saved me from that. But um, but I do think that there's a difference between um, uh, between what I trained with and what I'm dealing with now, but I don't know that it impacts my outcome. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Back to Juni. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cheng. And last but not least of our panelists, uh, Dr. Ting Chen Lu. Dr. Lu. Hi. Hi, Dr. Darius. Nice How to meet you. Hi. How are you? Good. I think so, I heard. Sorry, I think I think we met in Colorado Springs. Maybe do we meet in yes, Colorado Springs? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yes. <laughs> yes. Great to see you. Yeah. So uh, I always I, I'm the same. You always use the coastal color college graft for the nose. So I just have a question because you you said you use allogenic cartilage graft. So I just wondering about the resorption rate of the allogenic college. Yeah, so um, so it's an interesting, um, it, it's a great question. It's the natural question. So I have gone back in a couple of noses, um, not because I was worried about projection or the rotation of the tip, but because um, there was some, let's say, alarim uh, asymmetry. So particularly in bilaterals where one side is complete and the other side is incomplete, it's just really hard to get that symmetric on the first try. And so, and I found in some bilaterals where there's really severe soft tissue envelope limitations that I don't always get the lengthening and projection that I want. And frequently like I'll get one or the other. It's usually that I'll get the projection but not the length. So they're a little bit turned up and I'll come back and re-project them. Um, and I open the nose and no cartilage is there. And I'm like, where'd the cartilage go? And I, but there's no, um, if you look at the photos over time there's no change in the nasal shape. And so my thought on it is if you go back, let's say on a, you're doing a secondary rhinoplasty, a cosmetic rhinoplasty, and you're dissecting and you find all the graphs, but the graphs, when you take them out, it's nothing that you would ever use for support, right? It's still there, but it's like kind of like thin, it's kind of crunchy, and maybe you use it for like a tip graph, but nothing more than that. And so my thought is that it probably lasts long enough that um, it withstands the contractile forces of the soft tissue envelope while, while they're trying to contract. And then once, once a kind of a homeostasis is achieved between the, the 
the supporting structures and the soft tissue structures that it's not serving a role and it probably does resorb. Um, but I don't think it has a negative effect on the nasal tip shape, the nasal tip projection, the alar rim shape. Now that said, um, I don't have like 10 year follow-ups. I don't have 20 year follow-ups, but that's my, my um, experience. And I've looked at outcomes at a year and they're equivalent to autologous cartilage. But again, I don't have the decade long follow-ups. What I tell patients is if you're looking for like a guarantee of, um, you know, the support being there longer term, then using autologous cartilage is probably what you ought to do. But in my experience, when you talk through the equivalence of outcomes, at least in the one year range, patients will usually opt for the allogeneic cartilage to avoid the donor site if they're a male, because one, males are wimps, and two, um, they don't want a scar on their chest. And if it's females, then they'll say, yeah, sure, I'll do um, autologous cartilage because they're like, well, I can hide it in the breast fold and I'll be fine. And there are obviously challenges because the allogeneic cartilage will come in a sheet that's pre-cut. And so if it warps, when the manufacturer is making it, they will discard it. So it's gone through a cutting process. It's had an opportunity to warp. If it is not significantly warped, then they package it and deliver it. So that's one advantage of the allogeneic over autologous. Um, whereas obviously if you use autologous rib, you know, you cut it and then you come back and the rib is like this and you're like, okay, like, I mean, you can overcome those warping deformities, but it's got its own source of frustration. So I don't know what the right answer is, but I think it's something worth thinking about, particularly in the older patient when they're going to have more calcifications and, um, and, or a patient who is just not, um, uh, who is male, who doesn't want a scar on their chest, um, or someone who's, um, has some, medical issues that make it um, counterproductive for them to have an additional donor site. Okay. Thank you very much. Of course. It's good to see you. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Liu. Now, um, Professor Derdarian, um, we have two questions from the audience. So even though we're run running a little late, I was wondering if you would like to answer them. Of course. Okay. Thank you. Um, so the first question is from Yossi from... Uh, Hassan Nudin University, and he'd like to ask you, um, do you use a nose retainer after the surgery? If yes, how long would it be? No, I, I do not. Um, I, I, I don't think it's necessary. Um, if, so it's important to close dead space, right? So if you are using um, a stent to close dead space, I think that's a, a good idea. Um, what I do instead is sort of, um, so in a primary cleft lip repair, um, cutting would do what he called a modified McComb suture where to extinguish the vestibular web, he would pass a PDS suture from lining through the skin and the crease and then back through the same hole. So you wouldn't have the bolsters on the outside, but you're closing down the dead space. And uh, I do the same thing in um, the rhinoplasties because in my um, experience, it's important to close down that dead space, particularly where you're um, taking the lateral cruise away and repositioning it. You're putting a, a, a thin batten graft over that lining, but you want that lining to be adherent to the, that cartilaginous support that you're providing. Um, even though it's just a sort of, it's not a, a fixed sheet, by placing that suture through, you're really closing down that dead space and preventing scar tissue from forming there that can uh, in, in negatively impact the nasal airway dimensions. And so I do that all the way around the ala to extinguish all the dead space there. And so I think that's probably much of the utility of a nasal stent after a, um, a rhinoplasty is preserving the nasal airway dimensions and avoiding uh, you know negative impact on the nasal airway space. But if you're putting rib in the nose, you're essentially putting an in vivo stent in place because it's so strong. So I don't think it's necessary. Okay, thank you. And um, our next question is from Dr. Honda from Japan. 
And he liked to ask you, when is the be uh, best timing to put cartilage graft to the piriform? Is it possible to do so during the growing period? Yeah, it's a great question. I've thought to myself, should I just be doing it at the time of like the primary lip repair? Because, you know, if I can take, you know, an allograft and put it, you know, in that space and provide some additional support, um, why not do it? Um, so the, the short answer is, I don't know. Um, I think if you did it at that time, it would be fine. In my experience, you have another shot to augment that space when you're doing an alveolar bone graft. Um, I've tried many times to like put extra bone in and try to lift up the, um, you know, the alar base by, um, if you will, over expanding the, um, the projection of the piriform aperture at the time of bone graft. That doesn't seem to work. I'm not sure why that is. I don't know if it's like a Melvin Moss kind of model where it's like the body's like, no, that doesn't belong here. So we're not going to allow it. Um, but that hasn't been effective, but that's another opportunity to, I think, consider augmenting that space. And then obviously the time of jaw surgery is another time to augment that because you're looking right at it. And if you can do something definitive at that time, then it's obviously going to speed up your rhinoplasty. So we've got lots of time intervals in which to do this. And, you know, I guess um, you could work your way backwards and like do it at the jaw and then like, oh, that worked well. I'm gonna do it at the bone graft. Oh, that worked well. And then I'm gonna do it at the time of the primary. Um, I guess the short answer is, I don't know, but I think it's a good idea to do it at any of those times. Okay, thank you. And we have one more last question from our audience from Mohammed Farid Ratman. And he like to ask you, um, do you always use a septal cartilage for both of the lateral cartilages in unilateral clep case? So for a lateral pro strut, you mean? Yeah, I think so. If I can, um, it all depends on what the patient has to give. Um, and so it's not infrequent that I have like adult patients come and they've had a rhinoplasty before and they don't have any septal cartilage to give and everything is rib. Um, so the problem, you know, the issues with that is you just, again, have to prepare the patient. I like septal cartilage for lateral coral struts because you, the patient blows their nose or they push on their, or they're sticking their finger up their nose, whatever they're doing, the cartilage will accommodate that. If it's rib, it's really stiff and it doesn't feel natural. Um, and it will soften over time, but, um, but it's, for those reasons, I think it just, is more of a natural feel and mechanically acts more similar to um, the native cartilages to do um, the lateral curl strut. That said, um, again, my priorities, like priority one is septum uh, for the septal extension graft because I feel like that's the keystone of the nasal tip. Second is the lateral curl strut graft. And so um, if, if I can, I would like to. What I think is the least important is the extended spreader graft. So the extended spreader graft, I think you use rib for that every time because um, unless you don't need it, but but it's not of any consequence, I think, in terms of the mobility of the nose, the feel of the nose, or the, um, the long-term support. Okay, yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Junior. Thank you, all the panelists, and thank you the most thanks for the Professor Tadarian. Uh, I'm Pang Yin, and I'm so happy to have the Professor Tadarian here with us. Uh, absolutely, I think everybody has a very good morning and a very good evening to have Professor Tadarian here to share his experience in the CLAB rhinoplasty. Uh, of course, I would like to invite all our participants to show your smile please because the in this moment i would like to store all of your smile with professor darian together yes in this uh, great time thank you very much for your cooperations yeah come on come on today we have, <laughs> yeah. i'm making my screen bigger so i can see all the smiles oh uh, of course um, uh -huh. Uh, we got people today. in the OR. Wow. Uh, All right. That's awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. Um, it's really, as I said, an honor. And, um, you know, obviously um, there's a good relationship between our institutions and, uh, and I hope that continues into the future. But, um, it, you know, obviously 
you should know that we uh, hold uh, your institution in such high regard and really appreciate all the contributions that you've made to uh, cleft and obviously all of plastic surgery, but cleft and craniofacial surgery uh, specifically. So it's really an honor to be with you and thank you for the, uh, for the, the uh, great morning or evening yes. for you. Thank you, Chris. And I would like to take the group photo. And after the group photo, please stay uh, in tune for two more minutes because our director of the Chang'an Forum this year, 2022, Professor uh, Frank Chen, will give a little bit of promotion and to show you what is our program this year for all of you. Thank you. Great. So I will count to three and you please give me a cheese, okay? Yeah, and you can show any gesture in front of your screen. Okay, one, two, cheese. Oh, very, very beautiful. Uh, I will turn to the next page. Uh -huh. Okay, for my friend. Okay, one, two, cheese. Okay, thank you very much. So now I will give the time to uh, Frank. Yes, Professor Frank, please. Yes, please. Yes, uh, uh, please uh, save your time and join us to our uh, 12th International Workshop in Credit Empire. This year, we will incorporate more, uh, more videos. For unilateral deep repair, uh, we will emphasize different methods, uh, like a fissure. Uh, Dr. Lu is doing fissure. Uh, Myself is doing motor, and uh, I think uh, Professor Lo is doing uh, Mila. And uh, uh, in the discussion, we will show how the difference between those uh, methods. And uh, for, for uh, CAP also plastic surgery, we are more incorporated with uh, CAT scan. And uh, this, this year, we will have video. We will have uh, detail about this. And the uh, um, difference of last year, this year we will also incorporate with uh, microsia and the hemifacial uh, microsomia. So please join us. Uh, until today, more than 150 uh, participants registered. So please, all of you are welcome to join us. Uh, thank you. Yeah, Dr. Lo, back to you. Hey, Dr. Zhou, you're on mute. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, thank you. And a special thanks to the, uh, our first relay speaker, uh, Professor Tadarian, because uh, we hold the pre-congress of the Chang'an Forum and uh, all the special speaker like the, today's our speaker, Professor Tadarian, and then is the Dr. Siwer, Dr. Miyazili, and Dr. Padua. They all focus on the special field of the clip because today, uh, the, this year, our main topic of Chang'an Forum focuses on the clip care. So our slogan is the optimal outcome for clip care. So please uh, maintain and uh, stay in tune for our the other uh, pre-congress the program in the ICC webinar. At that, thank you. Good morning, good evening, and a special thanks to. Chris, thank you for your coming to as our speaker today. And I have a good day and I have a good night. Thank you very much. And good night, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank bye. you. Bye. Bye. -bye.